or I don't know. two pages because you know people get so busy and you just don't see it. Well, thank you all for coming. And if you're as you come in, if you will sign in, pick up a packet, and we have um, NTPA coordinator copies of the handbooks, which just means that you don't get to keep it unless you become <laughs> NTPA coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much for coming. Um, there might be people who come in later, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is cookie cutters are for cookies, not students. And so today what we're talking about is addressing the, how the NTPA addresses diversity uh, in classrooms. Uh, but you've probably seen this. If I go into uh, my secondary ed um, classroom and sit down with those students, at, uh, and t unless Janice has got a hold of them, <laughs> and if I say, what do you teach? They're going to say math, English, history. But what we'd like for them to believe that they teach our students. And if they can change their mindset to where they're concentrating on students that they teach and the content being secondary uh, to what the students, uh, I believe they'd be better off. I used to, when we used to have the teacher admission boards, um, I would get really frustrated with people who um, wanted to teach because they loved history or they loved science. And I think, oh my goodness, you're not going to last. <laughs> because this is not about loving of content. Teaching is about loving to work with people. And if that's not describing you, then you may be in the wrong place. So differentiation became a term while I was teaching. A hundred years ago, I began teaching, sort of like Doris over there and Janice. We've been teaching since the beginning of time. And they still can't get rid of us in the schools. But when we, during the time I was teaching, they came up with the term differentiation. When I was being trained as an elementary school teacher back in the dark ages, we just called it uh, individualized teaching or learning or whatever um, and people just really freaked out with that term and uh, I don't really think that it's necessary to freak out I remember um, when I got my master's in special ed I had to do a workshop with a group of teachers and they were so resistant to the idea of differentiation and all I could really do was to say yep you're already doing it so I wanted to show you this to kind of get you how I how I think of differentiation. I've just come from my favorite store, the Dollar Tree, and I have some suggestions for a party if you would like to have some educators over to your house this summer. They got some great ideas. They got these pineapple cups, these coconut cups. You could have a Hawaiian theme party. But I have an even better suggestion that's going to blow your mind. You can get these great cups at, at the Dollar Tree. And I know what you're thinking. That's just a red Solo cup. <coughs> Let me show you something. Boom. They have a different size. Wait one more time. Boom. <laughs> Differentiation party. You can meet the needs of all your party goers. Some people just need a regular size drink. Some people don't need that much drink. Some people need a big old drink. You can meet the needs of all your party goers with these great red Solo cup from the Dollar Tree. Think about all the possibilities at your differentiation party. You can differentiate the food. You could have some wings, some barbecue wings, a little bit spicy. For those that don't like spicy, you could have some honey barbecue wings. For those that need some extra spice, you could have some of them five alarm Tabasco wings. You could differentiate the heat in your wings. You could have some meatballs, and you could meet the needs of those that don't eat red meat by having turkey balls. You can meet your party goers' needs by having some tofu balls for those that are vegetarians. You can even differentiate your dip. You can make one of them seven layer dips with the refried beans and the salsa and the onions and cheeses. You can differentiate and make a six layer dip. Maybe leave out the onions. 
Then you could make an eight layer dip, <laughs> maybe add some extra festive cheese. <coughs> you could even differentiate the time of your party. You could have your party from seven to nine, invite all the fun people from seven to nine, but you could actually invite the wild, crazy people from six to nine because they can handle some extra time. Then you could just invite the fun people a little bit boring that can't handle a big old long party. You could do them from eight to nine. You could even differentiate the time of your party. I'm telling you, there's a lot of things you can do with your differentiation party. Starting out with these great cups from the Dollar Trees. <laughs> Go out, you get you some. You're going to be the talk of all the teachers at your differentiation party. So I think the reason this resonates with me is because I think we make it we make too big a deal out of it. That yes, there are some uh, evidence-based strategies. Uh, there are there is knowledge. That, that we can learn from studying um, students with special needs. But basically, I think that if we empower our students to just think of ways that they can help learners, then it would make it less scary. People tend to avoid what they're afraid of. So what I tell them is that if you're a good teacher, your students are learning, all the students are learning, you're probably already differentiating. And so we kind of begin there. Differentiation is on a continuum. This is in your packet. I like this continuum because it shows what a not differentiated classroom looks like compared to one that is fully differentiated. For example, um, instruction is whole class. Or on the other end, flexible grouping. Um, grading is based on teacher set and flexible objectives. Grading is determined by learning goals. And one of the things that I've done in, in some of my classes is when we've talked about differentiation is we get this out and we talk about where on this continuum their mentor is. And occasionally we have somebody that says that their, their mentor is way over here and I'm amazed. And then we have some that maybe are more over here. But most people are here in the middle. And I believe the most important message to get out there to our students is that it's just important to be on the continuum. You don't have to be perfect, you just have to be improving. This all kind of comes down to topics of equality and equity, and this is a popular uh, meme that's been out there for a while, and it, it, it I think, really demonstrates what we want to do in the classroom is not provide the same thing, but provide for our students what they need in order to make them successful. In the Ed TPA, diversity, teaching diverse learners is a major cornerstone. One of the things they have to do is that they have to describe the diversity of the classroom. They do this with the context for learning and they do it in their planning commentary. They have to plan for diverse learners. So all the way throughout the uh, EdTPA, they have to talk about diverse learners, planning for them. They have to talk about how they instructed diverse learners, how they assessed diverse learners. And then they are asked to reflect on how effective their strategies were for diverse learners. And they need to talk about how they're going to use their assessment data to inform instruction going forward for those diverse learners. EdTPA has novice teachers think about knowledge of students, their assets, awareness of students' strengths and needs, respect for diversity and individuality, using a variety of strategies, thinking about supports, equitable practices in assessments, and anticipating misconceptions or stumbling blocks. So if y'all heard my electoral college story, you may have heard it. It's a good story. I love stories, but this story is a good one because when I used to teach uh, seventh grade civics, every year the students struggled with learning about the electoral college. Well, what was interesting to me is that they did fine with really telling me the process. But when it came time to take um, an assessment, they had difficulty. 
And after looking at it for a few years, I realized what was the problem was that they couldn't get the word college out of their brain. And the picture of an actual college building was interfering with, uh, Lindsay, could you get the door for us? Was actually interfering with, um, thank you, uh, with their learning. So, one year, I taught them the electoral college process without telling them the name of it. I said, this is how we elect a president. And we went through the whole process. And then after they were able to tell me what the process was, I said, and it's called electoral college. Can you believe that? And I never had the problem again. So just finding out what that stumbling block was and that misconception was, of course, I was an experienced teacher, and I've been teaching that subject for a while. That's not something a brand new teacher uh, necessarily knows. But thinking about them and trying to anticipate them is important. Another thing that we run into often is, I'm sure some of you supervisors run into this, is that the students don't want to talk about the diversity in their classroom. They, uh, they want to uh, talk about the IEPs and the 504s. Maybe they have an English language learner, um, but they don't want to think about the different learners. Because the truth of the matter is, if you start describing the different learners in the classroom, there's going to be 35 of them. And we have to begin thinking of everybody in the classroom as being a different learner. All of them are different. So we might think about beginning with having students look at their class and stop looking at the norm, but instead look at the different members of the classroom separately. Because they do need to consider um, struggling readers. Uh, they can think about um, gifted students, academic gaps. One of the things that they should think about is prior knowledge. Strengths and needs, not strengths and weaknesses, but strengths and needs. Scaffolding to support the learners. And then the personal cultural community assets. This is a term that's unfamiliar for a lot of us. But personal asset, that refers to a specific background information that students themselves bring to the learning environment. So these are the things that we know about students that you know are things that they can draw on. Their family experiences, their experiences outside of school. Oftentimes when, uh, when we begin with EdTPA, the students when they're talking about personal uh, assets, they want to say, well, my students like to draw. And I said, that's great. Are they drawing outside of school? Because what we're talking about here is what they can, what you can draw on that's outside of school when we talk about personal assets. Um, cultural assets and community assets. Again, these are the traditions, the dialects, the worldview, the literature, the art, um, the community, local landmarks, community events. These are the assets that are the positive parts of our children's lives. And this is where we need to, this is where the relevancy comes in and our real world connections. This is of course the message that we want to bring, that all of our children are welcome here. And we do that by being responsive to students' needs and respecting diversity and promoting mutual respect among students. These are all the things that I know that you know, but this is how the Ed TPA talks about them. This is the language that they use. They talk in terms of assets, scaffolding, strengths, needs, prior knowledge. This is their language. Responsiveness to student needs respecting diversity, promoting mutual respect among students. When we've all seen this too. And you think about this, this is, this is at the heart of what we're talking about with the EdTPA. Making 
our uh, content accessible to all the students. Equitable practices and assessment needed here. And of course we talked about the obstacles, thinking about the obstacles and the misconceptions in learning. Now in your handbook, or you can just look on your handout, the first couple of questions that you learn, uh, run into this is uh, knowledge of students to inform teaching and then supporting students and then whatever learning. This is the ELL, language, uh, sorry, ELA learning. They talk about prior learning and prerequisite skills, personal, cultural, and community assets related to the central focus. So the teacher, the student teacher, when they're writing this part of the EdTPA, they need to first of all identify the prerequisite skills and knowledge that students need before they begin their teaching, their students need. They need to figure out how to assess that prior knowledge um, and prerequisite skills. They need to know their students' everyday experiences, cultural backgrounds and practices, language backgrounds and practices and interests. They need to recognize the variety of learners in their class, not just the 504s, IEPs, but the struggling readers, the underperforming students, the gifted learners, those with academic gaps. Whenever I have a student that tells me, all my students are doing great, I say, really? Wow. So you don't have anybody underperforming. Everybody is performing exactly where you think they ought to be. Because that's some tracking on steroids there, if they've got it down to that. But, you know, I've worked on that with every lesson plan I get. It's just, just, I'm telling you, they just don't want to deal with it. And they're not seeing, they're not seeing uh, often their mentors do it. So we, we have to continue to harp on it. Yeah. yeah and we even have mentors, I think, who have told them that they don't do it unless a child does have an IEP or 504. But we're yeah. here to teach best practice, and that's what we'll, what's what we do. Um, academic gaps can be caused by someone being absent, missing a class because of tardies. There's some kids in high school that never go to first period. They've got a ton of academic gaps. And then planning specific strategies and supports to address that. In these prompts that are in task one, prompt two and prompt three, what they do is first of all describe the students, how the students are diverse and special, and then they talk about how they support that diversity. Here are the rubrics that go with them. This is rubric two planning to support varied student learning needs. The evidence comes from the context for learning, prompt two and three B. And then you have rubric three, which is using knowledge of students to inform teaching and learning. By the way, that's in team. But at the bottom of the barrel here, this would be a candidate who does not address any of the requirements that are in the IEPs or 504s. Plan supports are tied to learning objectives and the central focus. Supports address the needs of specific individuals or groups with similar needs. So we're not just looking for learning partners. We're looking for strategies that have been specifically designed for a specific objective. For example, if you were teaching addition, you might pull out a number line and teach a specific strategy. You might make manipulatives available. But they always have to be thinking about what support for what objective. Now, the, lear the learning partners, the uh, shoulder part, whatever you call them, those are great supports, but they're very general. To get a five, 
they have to talk about supports that are specific um, and in addition respond to any kind of misconception or common errors or anything that they anticipate the students are going to struggle with. Candidates justification of learning task is either missing or represents a deficit view. Do you all know what deficit view means? It's okay if you don't. I just learned a few years ago. I've never heard of it because we just called it negative bias. But it's a little bit different from negative bias because in a deficit view it doesn't it sounds like you're making an excuse it sounds like you're saying when you say this child could learn if it weren't for its parents his parents that's a deficit view because you're viewing the child through its deficit his deficit I've got to stop saying it. it's not a puppy <laughs> so that's different from having a negative bias toward a certain group of people so I think that's that's where the difference is um, does anyone have any comments to add on deficit view where you've learned about it in coursework we talk about it in read 4026 mm -hmm. because they actually um, deliver assessments to students and then they do have this background report that's meant to be uh, preparation for the context for learning yeah and we talk about an assets minded approach versus a deficit view um, because you hear teachers in the field that say this is hard he just can't read um, right. you know or I, I taught his brother and his brother can't read yeah. real well and it's kind of the family thing uh, or using you know they live back in the mountains uh, and they don't really you know, should have had his dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and no that seems to be fairly like, common. Yeah. Uh, and and I think the people who who talk in this way are very well meaning. Uh, they don't realize that what they really are communicating is a view of the child that is negative. It's you're only viewing them for the deficit not saying this child is fantastic at drawing this child comes from a, a loving home or you know it, it does look at the deficits and it's harder to avoid the deficit view it takes more work it takes a change on our part to view students through their assets rather than their deficits and that change on our on our part it's got to come with self-awareness and that's probably the hardest part just like me with you know since I'm perfect how on earth could I need possibly any change right well, let's just count the ways <laughs> <laughs> so then you have the student then justifies why the learning tasks are appropriate for that student and they base that justification on the prior academic learning the personal cultural community assets um, and research and theory actually comes later so research and theory uh, is is great I'm all for it but as far as ed TPA is concerned it's not the names that you can regurgitate it's the ability to make that connection to actually go to this strategy because it's evidence-based to actually use this because we know it works not to throw away throw out the names and so the, uh, the NTPA I think a lot of people think that there's a lot of citations involved and there's just that's not even part of the scoring they could they could not put one single citation in it and it would be perfectly fine um, we don't tell the students that necessarily but I, I don't I don't overemphasize the citations I'll, I will admit to that monitoring their learning uh, planning formal and informal assessments that provide direct evidence so the, at this point in the planning commentary it's all about describing formative assessments 
either formal or informal formative assessments throughout and the assessments need to be related to um, the subject specific emphasis and you need to have a design or an adaptation of your planned assessment that allows students with specific needs. What's going to make the difference between a student that scores a three or four and a student that scores a five on rubric five are those students who know how to create a modified assessment or a modified rubric. And this is the technology one, and notice that they put in here students with poor spatial skills. There's, most of the time these highlighted boxes have very little differences um, in them, but this one does. So this is rubric five. Again, if the candidate does not attend to any of the requirements of the IEP in 504, then um, that's a one. It's an automatic one. And those things are reported in the context for learning. They have to have assessments that support the SSE, but they have to have multiple forms that monitor students' progress that are strategically designed to allow individuals or groups with specific needs to demonstrate their learning. My theory is that one of the things that's stopping our candidates from getting more fives is because oftentimes the five is where they have to talk about this differentiation that they've put in. That's usually where you start to see this higher level. So they have to address the IEPs and 504s and to get a five, they need to be able to come up with a modified assignment. So this is a good reflection question. In your program, who, what instructor is taking responsibility for teaching our pre-service teachers? Task analysis. So, I remember in my, my elementary program, I, we had to take a skill that we were going to teach and we had to sit down and we had to list every single prerequisite skill that went along with that new skill. Where is this being taught? I'm not saying it's not being taught. I'm just saying, do we know? Could we tell the class? Diagnostic assessments, practicing, creating assessments for students' prior knowledge. Where are our students getting that? Where are they getting practice identifying personal, cultural, community assets? Where are they learning about self-awareness of deficit views? Because until we make them aware that they have deficit views, they're, they're going to have them, whether they pretend to have them or not, they'll be there. Uh, knowledge of a variety of learning needs, practice planning strategies, supports, modifications, adaptations, practice modifying assessments. These are some things that need to be in our coursework. When we get into rubric six, this is where we're looking at the instruction commentary, task two. And here um, in rubric six, they focus on respect and rapport, a positive low risk environment, but challenging learning environment that promotes mutual respect among students. Now this is where the students get confused. There is a difference between evidence of mutual respect in your classroom among your students and then evidence of the student teacher promoting it. So when a teacher is promoting mutual respect, that's when they're saying like, things like, boys and girls, remember our rules when we you know, line up? Are we taking turns? Did you remember to raise your hand? Remember to listen to your partner when they answer the questions. Giving them sentence stems to use when they're in discussions. It's giving them uh, supports. So our students need to learn about ways to help their students 
express varied perspectives. So as we're moving to helping our candidates move from a three to a four to a five, which is going to be critical over the next few years as we move to a score of 42, we've got to have more fives to counterbalance twos. Then we have to think about how are we helping them with this skill. Maybe they could practice it in their classes. Um, this is the question that it comes from. Uh, how, will you demonstrate, how will you demonstrate use of respect, but more importantly, describe your instruction, uh, how it links prior learning with personal cultural community assets, and then it gets into that part as well. Rubric seven, engagement. So this is where they're promote. This is a. Uh, this would be prompt two and excuse me, prompt um, three with task two. Explain how your instruction engaged students. Describe how your instruction linked students' prior academic learning and personal cultural community assets. So you know how uh, we we like for them in the beginning of their lessons to say. Yesterday we learned, and today we're going to learn. That's, that is evidence of linking prior learning. That's the evidence they're talking about. Adding in relevancy, how this is relevant to their students' lives would be an important part of that too. Asking the students to put in the lesson plan, how are you making this relevant to your students' lives once they leave the school building? <clears throat> now, to get beyond a four on here, students not only uh, have do this linking themselves, our teacher candidates, they get the students to do it. The students make those connections, but the, the candidate prompts them to. So instead of saying, yesterday we learned, today we learned, we say, what did we learn yesterday? Who remembers? So what do you think we might be learning today? How is that going to help you with and come up with some sort of real world relevance? Terrell, can I ask a question? If that's not on the video, though, they can't talk about it, right? That's correct. Okay, so that has to be on the video. That's so that right. might limit their where they say that in the video instead of saying it right at the beginning, right? Yes. Okay. So oftentimes, what, do you know how in team, it part of it says that the, the teacher goes through and talks about the objective throughout the lesson? Mm -hmm. So I think revisiting the objective and, and revisiting the, pro making connections throughout the lesson would be a way to help them with that. How long of a video do they get? Is it seven minutes? <laughs> They get like anywhere from, no one has more than 20 minutes. And it's, it depends. Everybody's is different. Some people have two videos, combined 15 is the lowest that I know of. Um, what is your all's, Angela? We have two videos, um, maximum 15 minutes. Yeah, that's what the elementary math is too, and it's, it's pretty low. <clears throat> I would imagine special ed to get in there 15 minutes. Yeah, it's a lot. I'm sorry? I, I would imagine special ed would be a little bit longer. It's not. <laughs> no, it isn't. Uh, on who you know, they, can, they can do, there's more videos besides the instruction videos, but unfortunately, the other videos might be for, uh, for assessment work sample or an assessment feedback, or it might even be for communication. But, and so, uh, that, that can't be evidence for rubric six, seven, eight, nine. And the lesson plan can't be evidence. No. Not the the only plan. evidence for the task two is the video. That's why it's so critical that we what we make sure students are getting this in their lesson plans and it's it's there. Analyzing the teach analyzing teaching. So I've kind of put rubric 10 and 15 here together because they're not the same. I get this all the time. Rubric 10 and 15 are the same. No, they're not. 
None of the rubrics are the same. I wish they were. That'd be one less thing I'd have to worry about. But they're not. And knowing the difference is important because rubric uh, 10 is reflection on your teaching practices. <coughs> How could you better support, for example, individual students? How could you better support the students in your class based on what you saw while you were teaching? Rubric 15 is using the assessment to talk about what are the next steps, not what you would do differently, but where are you going from here? And hint, they don't want you just remediating. They want you to go on in your curriculum, but using different strategies that, are, that, you, that you've learned to use. So rubric 10, candidate proposes changes that address individual and collective learning needs. You have to be careful because the prompt says, for most of us, says uh, groups with, with special needs. But the rubric says individuals. Now the prompt and the rubric don't match. It's the rubric you pay attention to because that's what they're using to score with. Um, so then you've got rubric 15. Next step, provide targeted support to individuals or groups. So this is changes that you would, uh, you would create in your lesson if you were to teach it again next year or whenever. And this is where are you going next week? <laughs> so there's a big difference here. But they both have, they, you have to consider the individual. So in our program, think about your program. Where do the pre-service teachers, where do they learn what it means to be responsive to varied needs and backgrounds? What does that mean? Responsive to varied needs and backgrounds. Because they answer that question in, with uh, prompt one and they struggle. Where in the program are they getting practice creating activities that are challenging? So maybe all over the place, I don't know. But is there a place where you take one activity and you modify it to make it more challenging? Do they get practice linking instruction to prior learning? I think they do. But where? Where are they learning to do that? Practice linking assets to learning. Where do they reflect on improvements to support, um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't word that correctly, meet the, uh, to meet individual needs. I think this would be a, a good place to put in a reflection after students have taught a lesson. And it might be something supervisors or clinical instructors could add as an assignment. What would you do differently that would help the students and that you taught and help meet individual needs? Didn't they used to have to keep a journal or something, a reflection yeah. on? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of assignment changes have been made because of the, the demands on our candidates. So I think some things went out um, that were considered unnecessary, but maybe there's some things that need to be just modified instead of thrown out. <coughs> Analyzing assessment data. So I think they could just, you know, if they were in a field class, could they not? get a set of their mentors assignments and look at it and come up with trends I don't know I'm doing all this in read 4026 junior year good but not every class can have access to students like we bring in university school students mm -hmm. and we're doing this and it's working well but I don't think Everyone can do it if, yeah. if they have a section that well, you know, at four o'clock in the evening. You know, even if you had, even if you had um, 
students analyze the assessment of their own class, your class, the one that you're teaching with your students, the college class, even if it was an activity they did in class, that they did amongst themselves. But being able to look at a set of, of, uh, of assessments and say, here are some trends, here are some learning patterns, and then come up with what they're going to do. How, how is that in, information going to change their instruction going forward? The task three is not about what they, were, what they learned which a lot of people think it is. They'll say, Miss Rock, what if none of my students do well on my test? I'm like, good, <laughs> you're gonna have a lot to talk about. Or if they all do super well. I know, you, if they do super well, you're actually in trouble because there's not, that's not uh, um, enough for you to talk about. What they have to do is that they have to find patterns of learning that are in the whole class, and represented by individuals and groups of individuals. And they have to analyze those patterns. They need to be able to turn what they think they see into graphical displays. Um, they need to be able to provide meaningful, individualized feedback. They need to be able to tell students specifically what they did well, what they need to work on, and what they need, uh, what they can use as a strategy. Most of the time, our students are confused with the difference between the term pre feedback and praise. Good job is praise, not feedback. So we have to make sure that they understand what good feedback looks like. Meaningful support for individuals, that's rubric 13, and understanding and use of feedback. This is our one, uh, probably our lowest rubric right now across the college. And what it is, is how you get, how, how do you plan? After you've given feedback to your students, how do you plan to make sure they understand the feedback? And then how are you going to support them in an opportunity to use the feedback? Now what does that look like? Well, it could look like me sitting down with groups of, pe of students who had similar feedback and actually just explaining to them what their feedback means. That would be me as the instructor making sure they understood their feedback. Using the feedback, supporting them while they're using the feedback is not homework. So having them fix it for homework is not support for use. So that doesn't work. So where are we teaching our candidates about this? The follow through. Describe next steps of instruction that address the needs of whole class, individuals, and groups. We've talked about that one already. So here's rubric 11. It comes from prompt 1C, basically. The student focuses on what the students, they analyze, focusing on right and wrong. Um, but it's important that they find the patterns of learning that are for the whole class and represent different individual learners. They have to make connections between quantitative and qualitative patterns of learning for individuals or groups. What we're doing is right here. Basically, we're here. Not quite gotten to where most of us are making the five yet. And then rubric 15 fits right in with 11. Because once they've analyzed, they take that analysis and they come up with the next steps. So this is where we're making our biggest problem is that they write this prompt one and then they go to prompt two and they're talking about feedback and they're talking, they're going to prompt uh, three and they're talking about uh, use of academic language. And the next thing you know, they're at the very last prompt and they get this question about um, next steps and they don't connect it to their analysis. So this year we're trying having the students write for this one and then write for this one 
right after each other. That way that connection is more clear. I'm hoping it works. Rubric 12, explaining how the feedback that's provided for the three focus students addresses their individual strengths and needs relative to the learning objectives measured. And then it's important to note that what they consider to be a level five feedback is feedback that in includes a strategy for an individual learning need. Rubric 13 comes from just 2C for most of us. And this is describing how you will support each focus student to understand and use the feedback so again, it's all about these individual students. This is an uh, explanation about understanding feedback, uh, an example, reviewing the work of the whole class, focusing on common mistakes, example of using feedback, asking students to revise the work. That's using, but it's not supporting. So that would be a level three. In order to get the level four here and the level five, They've got to support the students in using the feedback for strengths and needs. So I think 13 would be probably one of the hardest ones to make a level five on. But you should be able to at least do a four. So in your program, at what point do you give candidates practice with analyzing data, providing feedback, ways to help students understand and use feedback, devising next steps of instruction based on data? Your mission, if you decide to accept, <laughs> is to give pre-service teachers the tools to provide equitable learning experiences in diverse classrooms. And if we walk into a classroom and everybody in there is white, is the classroom diverse? Yes. Because diversity is a word that refers to more than race. When we talk about diversity, we're not just talking about race. So the two biggies that our teacher candidates have to get before any of this is going to work, they have to recognize diversity. They have to look at their group of students and say they're all different. Um, maybe having each child write about themselves or making uh, making an index card for each student in your classroom and as you learn about them adding things to their index card doing class interest surveys and get to know you activities and our lesson and then of course once they've recognized the diversity they need to address it and our lesson plans we do require that these be included this diversity but our students are not allowed to write in A because they've taken a cookie cutter and made their children with cookie cutters. You can't do that. One of the things we can do, we can think, we can teach them to think in terms of how to differentiate with content, process, and product, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, making the lessons more relevant. Um, and using their assets. Are we giving the topics of diverse learners and modifications equal time in our classes? I think that's a good reflection. So, recognizing diverse learners. The EdTPA does kind of get a lot of suggestions to try to get them to think about it. So they can be thinking about students who are underperforming, need a greater challenge, miss a lot of school, 
um, better at explaining orally than in writing. Um, early finishers, that's a thing you got to be aware of. And really emphasizing to them that they just need to be on the continuum, not trying to get it perfect from the get-go. Starting with differentiation that's easy to incorporate in their classroom, I think is key. Using low prep activities that aren't fancy, but are going to get used. For example, when I was teaching, I had a set of paper plates. They were grouped in fours, and they had A, B, and C, and D on them. And a, B, C, D, A, B, C, just a big old fat, and I would just go around and give four plates to each kid. I would put questions on the board that were all from, the, from an, an old test or something. Low prep, A, B, C, D. That's an example of a low prep activity. I just sat down one day and made a whole bunch of paper plates, and we reused them like crazy. That's a lot less prep than some of the things I did with trying to get everybody set up with an app, and then dealing with Wi-Fi or lack of Wi-Fi or this one doesn't know their password. So I think that sometimes it's great to talk about these fancy activities, but teaching our students how to wing it with practically nothing. What if one day there's nothing on the internet that we can get to? How will you do a game? And having that available low prep this is a you've got this list of low prep activities um, and then high prep and starting with the low prep and getting those started people are more likely to do it if they don't have to put a ton of effort into it it's more likely to happen They can start, when they're thinking about their students, they can start by trying different methods, strategies, materials. They can add in more modeling, more movement, more art, more music, more demonstrations, considering all ways that their students are different. Differentiated instruction includes respectful tasks flexible groups, and ongoing assessment. Respectful tasks. That means that your curriculum, that it's the tasks are curriculum based. They're different, but they're not less important. They uh, are equal in the terms that they, in, in the fact that they're still relevant, they're equally active, they're equally interested, so, for example, if you've got a student in your classroom that's not on reading level, handing them Dick and Jane is not a respectful task. So giving them uh, work that they can do with the support that they need to do it in a respectful way. Flexible groups, uh, ongoing assessment. We can differentiate by content, process, and product. In the land of differentiation, you want a positive, low-risk, challenging environment. That's straight from EdTPA. And in this environment, you want your environment to be a conducive atmosphere. Content. You can modify the content. You can modify the process, or you can modify the product. So when students are stumbling on what could I change, have them think in terms of the content, what, what they're teaching, the process, how they're teaching it, and the product, what they're having the students uh, come up with. These are some basic things. Thinking about the students, their readiness, their interest, their learning profile. So teachers can differentiate by content, process, product, learning environment. They need to think about readiness, interests, and a learning profile. I've added some other uh, materials here just to, there's so much good stuff out there. I wish the internet had been around all my life. 
I'd be a genius. <laughs> I love the internet. So yesterday, my husband, he said, we were trying to figure something. He says, let me get my brain out. <laughs> So this is a great example, for example, of, of different strategies of, for differentiating content, process, or product. If you take an example of, of teaching a history class, maybe if you were teaching the Holocaust, um, I might not, I probably wouldn't change the content, we would just teach the Holocaust to everybody, right? But the process of what I might do might be different for my struggling readers, my unmotivated learners, or a student that has an IEP. And then the product might be different as well. Offering choices. Other resources, I find that this is helpful with the students just to make them think of other ways that we could present material, different strategies multiple intelligence charts. I don't care if you believe that these things exist or not. I couldn't care less if you believe that learning styles exist or not. My point is, this right here gives us ton of ideas in order to make our lessons more engaging. And if they're more engaging, and if you're not teaching it exactly the same way all the time, you're going to be able to hit those different learners. Um, this is also a lot of different product possibilities that I found. Bunch of good stuff on um, teacher pay teacher. So let's not assume that the one SPED class that they have can teach them everything they need to know about SPED. Because let's face it, that's a major. Special education is a major or it's a master's degree. So we can't learn it all in one class. Don't expect that they're going to, because they can't. They're going to do well just to make uh, them aware of what kinds of children there are out there, their problems, the accommodations that need to be made, the laws. Um, you've got to, as you're working with these students, you've got to take responsibility for differentiation. Stop making it stop sound scary. I think that's huge. Just say, well, what are you doing? What could you change to make it better? That's just a simple question. Recognizing diversity and adding in supports. Um, having zero tolerance um, for any kind of claim that every child in a placement classroom is the same. I don't, I blah, 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 blah. Zero tolerance. I don't want to hear that mess. Don't even come to me with that. And then making sure that everybody understands just how important that meeting the needs of diverse learners is to our students' um, ability to perform well on the TPA. That's what's going to make the difference between them staying where they are and moving on. Because if you change nothing, Nothing will change. Do you have any questions? <coughs> do, the, do the students have this? Is this something? Well, not this in, in this in this packet. No. No. And everybody's taught by different people, so I really can't answer that question. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Well, I really appreciate you coming. Thank you very, very much. I'll be back on the 23rd of March teaching something. <laughs> I don't remember what it is. <laughs> but I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Carol. Sorry about my phone. I thought I turned it off, and I didn't. Uh -huh.